All right, hello once again. This is Jeff Scott of Rankin Technical College. And as you know, I've had some problems with Camtasia, which I think have been rectified. I've gone back and redone earlier lectures, but the only one that I had not done was the lecture for Chapter 12. So I'm going to do that right now. That's the last chapter we cover in any depth and breadth of coverage for the rest of the semester. And as it says there, this chapter shows you how to use AJAX, which is an acronym that stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, to do what's referred to as a partial page refresh. All right, and you've all seen this before. I, I went through this example when I actually went did it in class, but if I go out to Google, and I come in here and I start typing, I want to type in JavaScript, but I type in Java. Well, notice when I stop right there, there's a Java, there's a JavaScript, etc., you know, all sorts of stuff. But as I keep typing, what you see in here changes. This is known as Google Select, and what it's doing, it is just taking the stuff that's in here and it is updating it on the fly without having to rewrite the entire page. And that's the idea behind. Um, that's the idea behind Ajax. Now, I used to give an example where I went out to Family Video com. Now, I could still go out there because the site's still active, but they've changed it over the years. And what I mean, let's see, let's see if they, how much they've changed it. So I'm going to go out to December here. All right. And now notice that when I highlight these, it gets this kind of effect on it right here. See that? What used to happen right here was if I went and took my mouse and put it right there, that a little blurb would come off to the side here explaining what the movie was about while I had this highlighted. And then when I got off the highlighting, the blurb would go away. Another example of Ajax or a partial page refresh. Another one is Google Maps. Now, is that googlemaps.com? I don't even know. In fact, I spelled it wrong. maps.google.com. So when I go in there, you'll notice that as I go in and I go in or out of a certain place, basically what's that, what ends up happening is it ends up redrawing not everything on the page, but just what has to be redrawn. So with that in mind, the chapter will also talk about how to use Ajax in an actual, actual application. Now we've already done an example of this where we went out to the numbers API, whoops, API.com site. We went out here and we said, as an example, if you go out here and let's just say back in high school, my number on the baseball team was 11. So I go to numbers API.com slash 11 and it gives me a fact about 11. 11 is the number of incarnations of the Doctor and BBC sci fi series Doctor Who. Okay, fine. But the point is, if I change that from 111 to 1111 and hit enter, I get different. All right, I get a, I get a different thing in here. And if I put a number in that's too big, I'm not, I'm, oops, I'm not going to get anything, to be honest with you. So if I put in numbers api.com slash 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 ones, I get it's a number for which we're missing a fact. All right, but you know, for, for most numbers, so if I put in a thousand, it's the number of elephants it took to bring in the material for the Taj Mahal. You get the idea, all right? But the example that they give in here is one from Flickr, so we'll talk about that a little bit. I've already started to introduce you to how Ajax works. We'll talk about that, some of the common da data formats, uh, using the XML HTTP request, more often referred to as the XHR, XHR object, how to use it, then we get into some of the jQuery shorthand methods for working with this, the Ajax method, and then we end up with how to use Ajax with Flickr. All right. So as it says, there are four topics in here. So first they talk about what Ajax, how Ajax works. All right. <clears throat> they mention Google Suggest, which I've already shown you. Now, just so you know, when you start working with this, there's really two ways that you can handle this stuff. This chapter talks about more the old tried and true way, which is using the XML HTTP request object. 
There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. All right. It, it's tried. It's true. It works well. It's still used a lot today. There is another way that really isn't discussed in this chapter, which is referred to as the Fetch API. And the example that we did as a class, let's see if I can find it in my mess here. <clears throat> um, let's see if it's in here or not. So this is what we did. All right, so again, I come in here and I enter a number. Notice it'll update automatically. So one, there you go. 11, or 12, I guess you should say, 123, 1234, et cetera. All right? And I'm not going to lie to you. I believe in honesty. I believe in transparency. So when I go out to YouTube.com, and if I type in, because this is a gentleman I follow a lot, Brad Traversy. Whoops. Uh, what was it? Was it this one? There it is. Vanilla JS number facts. And I basically, I ripped his thing off. All right. I made a couple changes, but most of them were pretty superficial. And he does a very good job in here, as he always does, of, uh, of going in and <clears throat> explaining concepts. I would really recommend, if you've never done so, to go out to Traversy Media. I think it's media.com. This is his site. He's got a boatload of free videos that he puts out on YouTube. He's got courses that you can buy. I'm a Patreon of his. All right, so I get some stuff for free, and I have actually conversed with him on occasion. Okay, electronically. Okay. <clears throat> so let's jump back in here. <clears throat> As it says, to make Ajax work, all modern browsers provide this XHR object used to send an Ajax request to the web server. Now, the, the, the key line in here is this. It receives the return data from the server, and that data has just what part of the page should be refreshed, not the entire page. So if you can imagine with this app that I just showed you here, what if I decided that on the bottom of the page here, I wanted to add some JavaScript. And what I wanted to do is I wanted there to be a time, you know, so you, a person could always tell the running time. So right now it looks like it's 6.37 a.m. So let's say it's actually 6.37 and 50 seconds. All right. And I'd like it to update every second. Well, that's not really that hard of a thing to do. But if I don't use something like Ajax, what's going to happen is it's going to, the, the system is going to redraw the entire page every second. Well, I don't want that because I'll get this flicker effect, etc. And it really and truly won't look good because it's going to be continuously redrawing itself. What I want it to redraw every second is just the time that's down here. And that's when you can use something like Ajax. All right, so let's take a look here. I already showed you the Google Suggest. The key takeaway from this picture that you see here, these two pictures, is with a normal HTTP or Hypertext Transfer Protocol request, when it comes back, it's bringing a new page. With an Ajax request, it's bringing only the data that's changed. All right, so you can do what's called a partial page refresh. As they mention here again, it's asynchronous JavaScript and XML. That said, m much of the work that's done today does not use XML any longer. It uses JSON or JavaScript object notation. All right. As it says, JavaScript is essential to the use of Ajax because JavaScript not only sends the request, but also processes the, the response and updates the DOM. To send the request, we use this XHR object, which can include data that tells the application server what data is being requested. It's often processed by a program or a script on the server side. So it could be uh, a .php program. It could be a dot no JS program where you're writing JavaScript on the server. It could be something like an, uh, an ASP, all right, active server pages type of program. Today, as mentioned here, mo many sites, all right, like Blogger, YouTube, etc. Maybe you've done this. I know the other day it was my niece's daughter's birthday, you know, and I get the little thing that comes up on Facebook and I typed in there happy birthday and hit enter. Well, my whole page didn't refresh 
The only thing that refreshed was the little area where I typed happy birthday because it was now in there and it was a comment that was sent to her. So the common data formats for AJAX are XML and JSON. XML I'll give you a very, very brief little history, give you a little interlude here for five minutes or so. And with XML, which stands for the Extensible Markup Language, back in, I think it was around the 90s, somewhere in the 90s, um, people decided that HTML, Hypertext Markup Language, was too awkward to work with. And what was needed was a new language that would be easier to work with. Maybe even one where you could make your own tags up. All right, and that's how XML was, was born. And XML is still used. I don't mean to say that it's not, but it's not nearly used as much today as JSON or JavaScript object notation. And the reason for that is JSON looks very similar in format to data that you would get back if you were working with JavaScript and you were working on it in an object-oriented type of format, hence the name here. As it says, most server-side languages already provide functions for JSON encoding. All right. It's a subset of JavaScript, and it uses conventions similar to most other programming languages. All right. There are other things that can be used as well. The most popular are JSON, XML, and then just returning raw HTML. So here's an example of each one of those. In fact, I, I don't think they even show you because the whole book has been about HTML. But you'll notice with XML, you make your own tags. So there's a beginning and an ending management tag. There's a beginning and ending team member tag. There's another beginning and ending team member tag. So this would be management. Management has two team members. Each team member has a name, a title, and a little bio. All right. Here is the same information in JSON format. Okay, and it's typically easier to parse JSON data as opposed to trying to or having to parse XML. All right, if you want more information about JSON, you can go to JSON.org. If you want more information about XML, I would suggest you Google XML, and there's a very, very good article, although it's quite dated now, uh, XML. I just always put in O'Reilly article. This is how I learned it. I've actually taught XML in the past. So, <clears throat> um, that's it. A technical introduction. Okay. And the good news or bad news, so to speak, about this, if you print it out, it's about 20 pages long. But it's 1998. It's 22 years old. <clears throat> All right, so it seems a bit dated, but the information that's in there is still very good and very relevant. All right, so the next thing that's discussed in here is all the members, methods, properties, and events of the XML HTTP request, more often known as the XHR object. Two methods that you have to use with every request are open and send. Open, as it says, is used to open a connection for the request. It specifies whether it's a GET or a POST. The good news is you already know what GET and POST are. After the open is issued, the SEND method is used to send the request. If necessary, as it says, it can include a data parameter that sends the da sends data to the server, All right, typically used to filter the data that's re returned. So, for instance, if um, I was going to go and query the Amazon database for, for a book, I wouldn't want every book that, you know, if I wanted a book on Node.js, I'd want to filter my request so that what, what it gave me back were just books on Node.js, not every book they have. All right. When you work with this, notice there's a ready state property that indicates the state of the request. There are a status property and a status text property. All right. The status property, which we'll see in a minute, has a code. It's got a number and the message that's returned by the server. Then there's response text and response XML. So with a response text, you know, how do you want the information returned? In, in just plain text format or in an XML format? Finally, as it says, there is an on ready state change event used for an event handler to process the return data that we'll look at in just a bit. Again, the get and post are the same ones that are used for an HTML form. 
With a get, the data is sent to the web server as part of the URL known as the query string. <clears throat> but the amount of data is typically limited to about 4,000 characters. But with post, the data that is sent is sent in the, hit, the, the uh, headers. And the amount that you can send is unlimited. An advantage of the get is when you use a get, you can always go in and you can bookmark it where you can't bookmark with a post. There's other differences as well. Here are the main members of the XML HTTP request. From now on, I'm just going to refer to it as the XHR object. The ones that we're most concerned with are open. As it says there, opens a connection for a request. And notice too, it says the parameters let you set the method get or post, set asynchronous mode to true or false. With asynchronous, by default, and again, unless told otherwise, most programming languages, JavaScript being one of them, are synchronous in, in the way they work. In other words, if there's 10 things to do, it does number one, then number two, then number three, all the way down through number 10. But what if one of those operations was to go out to another server someplace, maybe on another part of the world, and it might take a few seconds. It might even take several seconds. Well, if you set something to be asynchronous, what you can do is you can tell the system, well, you wait on that thing and don't, do, don't, don't actually process that until you get stuff returned. But while you're doing that, I'm going to go on. And again, that's kind of the the um, hallmark of the class that you will take, the AWD1111. I think it's now called Database Driven Websites that you'll take in full. The other big thing is the send method. As it says, it starts the request. It can include the data that gets sent with the request. It must be called after the request connection has been opened. So here are some properties. All right, notice the ready state. So if I've, if I've got a request but I haven't sent it yet, it will be zero unsent. All right, there's one is open, two is the headers have been received, three is loading, and four is done. So what does that mean? It means it's happening in order. So I haven't sent it yet. Boom, I've sent it. Okay, now it's been opened, but nothing has been done with it yet. All right, then the headers have been received, but still nothing has been done with it yet. Then it's loading, and nothing has been done with it yet. Then it's done, which means that the information is now available. Response text and response XML, again, the difference between those is how the content is returned in a plain text format or an XML or an extensible markup language format. The status, as it says, common values are 200 for success, 404 for not found. Typically, they're 200, 300, 400, 500 messages. 200 messages typically mean request. 400 messages typically mean failure, and it's a failure on the client side. Maybe you put in a wrong file name or something, or a wrong path to a file. 500 um, error request messages are on the server side. Typically, as you know, there's nothing you and I can do about it. If if the the um, Amazon servers are down and I want to I want to place an order and I can't, you know, there's not much I can do about that. The status text, as it says, it's the status message that's returned from the server. And with on ready state, it's an event that occurs when the state of the request changes. All right. So how do you use this? And there's several examples on the next page here. As it says, the first example shows a portion of the XML file, but you can assume that it's going to include everything. The second one shows a div that you will receive the data by the XHR object. And the third example shows all of the code that goes along with this. So let's take a quick look. So the idea is you're able to click one of these buttons and it will immediately come over here and it will update the information that's shown. All right, in this case, as you can see, they're using XML data. All right, now you can parse XML data and make it look just like you know, any HTML document that gets returned. All right. So what we see in here is what are we doing? Well, notice here, here we're creating the new HTTP request. You can call this anything you want, but historically it's just called XHR. Then we've got our on ready state change. All right. If it's equal to four, and again, this book is a little bit dated, but it should be a triple equal there and a triple equal there. So if the ready state is equal to four, meaning it's done, and the status is 200, meaning it's been successful, then you go in and you return everything. But you're only going to be doing this stuff, you're only going to be doing this stuff if indeed that was what was returned. And 
All right, notice here it says function. So we're calling this is all a function right here. And it's an asynchronous function. So it's not going to call this, the, run this code until this ready state has been set. All right, and then you come down here. It's, you know, again, since it's doing this asynchronously, it's going to go and get the data for you and then it'll do the set. So as it says, this application uses the XHR object to load all the team members into a file named team.xml on the web server and then displays them in that div. All right, it parses the data returned only if the ready state property is 4, meaning that it's done, and the status property is 200, meaning it was successful. All right. Okay, now, one thing I don't like about these books, and I love, by and large, I love Muroc books, but one thing that I don't like about them is they always say stuff like this. Now that you understand how Ajax works and how to use, no, no, now that you've been introduced to the way Ajax works and how JavaScript works with it. All right. So the, the next figure that we'll look at in just a moment, as it says, summarizes the jQuery methods that you use to work with Ajax. All right. The load method to get HTML data, the dot get and the, got, the dot post rather, used to get XML data. As it says, that's the default. There's a dot get JSON also that can be used for JSON data. So the examples, as they mentioned, show how these methods work. The first one uses the load method to load the HTML. The second uses the get method to load the XML data. And the in the second example, it's coded with three parameters, the URL for a script that holds the information, or I'm sorry, that will process the information. The second parameter passes data in the form of a string to determine what, it's kind of like a where clause that you put in for a database when you say what you want to show or only what you want returned. And the third names the function called if that request is successful. Finally, there's the last example in there that uses dot get JSON. One thing to mention is it uses, that one uses the dot each method. The dot each is, for lack of better words, kind of the way that jQuery does a for loop. <clears throat> so here is the three examples. As it says, jQuery has several shorthand methods. All of them let you include data that will be used by the server to filter the request so you can only get the results that you want returned. The difference between the dot get and the dot post is what's used for the request. Now remember that typically, typically, a get is known as an accessor. So if I don't know you and I meet you, you know, so let's say I have students that come into class the first day and the first student walks in. Let's just say his name is Bob. And I don't know Bob. So he comes in and, I, and he says, hello, and I say, hi, what's your name? And he goes, it's Bob. Okay, that would be a get request because I am asking for information. All right, and I am accessing and you know, getting information, but I'm not changing it. What if it turned out that I had three Bobs in the class and they all wanted to be called Bob? All right, and I said, no, from now on, you came in first, you're Bob, you came in second, you're Rob, you came in third, you're Robert, as an example. That wouldn't be a get, that would be more like a post. Because with a post, typically, what you're doing is you want to be able to change information. So, for instance, <clears throat> if I've got existing information that's someplace, be it on the web, be it in a database, it doesn't matter, and I request that information. So, if I go out to Amazon and I ask, you know, you've seen all, you've all seen stuff like this before, but I go out to Amazon.com and I go in here and I choose books, what's it going to do? Well, sooner or later in here, it's going to give me a bunch of books, all right? But... The, the more specific I can be in here, so if I go node.js, ideally at least, now that's all it's going to give me, our books on node.js. All right. <clears throat> and again, with this dot each that's in here, <clears throat> oh, where is it? There. As it says, what, what it does is it goes through and it allows you to iterate over or go over an entire collection. All right, and when you're done with each item, if you want to do something special with each item, there's a callback function that you can call. All right, so the next thing talks about the load method here. Following along, I was trying to follow along in a regular textbook, but I stopped. So 
As it says, this next figure shows how to use the load method to load HTML data with an AJAX request. In the example here, three section elements are coded within a file named solutions.xml. All right, so that's one will be solutions, one will be support, one will be contact us. So this would be generic information, probably the stuff that you see up here. <clears throat> and if you clicked prospect, you might get this, convert, you might get this, contact us, etc. <clears throat> So when you look at the jQuery, ideally when you look at that, it's saying to just load in there, all right, the part of the file. Notice that there is a part of a file with an ID of VP pro, or V prospect, one with V convert and one with V retain. Well, what do I mean? Well, for example, there is the V convert. So it's only going to put the stuff in in that section. There will be two other sections, one for prospect and one for retain. So what you're saying is when I click the associated button only load in the information that I'm looking for. So as they mention here, the load function can only load content from files on the same server making the call. During testing it says you'll be able to load files from the file system in Firefox and Safari, but Chrome, IE, Edge, and Opera all require all of the files to be on the same actual web server. So there can be domain issues, in other words. And when you think about it, that's actually for a very good reason you would not want it set up so that I'd be able to go uh, on one website and maybe go out to a website that had, quote, bad data in it or in another domain and be able to, to, to look at or possibly even manipulate that data. All right. <clears throat> Next here, they are going into the uh, dot .get and dot .post method to load XML data. So as it says, the example here uses the dot .get method to load data from the web server. All right, it says, remember, a post works the same way, except the post method is used to send a request as opposed to getting a, re a request. The first parameter in the dot .get method gives the URL for the XML site that is to be loaded. The second parameter is the function that's used to process, so once the data is returned, what do you want to do with it? All right. And to process the return data, it says this function uses the find method for the data that's returned to find the children of the XML item named management. So in other words, this one is going to allow us to get the information about the team members. All right. I don't know if that's an about us. It doesn't really matter. But the point here is, you know, when you click, let's say when you click here, now you're going to get the information. And it's not showing all of it. You'd have to you know, uh, this would this would be where you'd have to arrow your way through this. Okay. So as mentioned, the get and post methods work the same, except for the method that's used to send the data in the request. You can use jQuery find to get the data. The first find method they show here starts a chain that gets all the children, and the other three find methods get the name, title, and bio for each team member. So it's kind of like, you know, when you look at it, when you do this, it's kind of like you're going through this and sort of looping within a loop. It's sort of like a nested loop. So for each child, we want the name, title, and bio. Then the next child, name, title, and bio. All right. So how to use the dot get JSON method. And as I mentioned to you before, JSON is more and more popular as far as you know, being being used as a data format. It's the one we'll use almost exclusively in the AWD 1111 class. If I go out to json.org, you'll see again one of the uglier websites, but that's it's very functional. So when you go out there, there's examples on how it's used, etc. All right, and there are plenty of different websites that you can go to to get information on JSON. I'm, I've never looked, but I'm sure that W3 schools dot com must have a JSON tutorial. JSON introduction. There it is. And when you look down here, there it is. I'm not going to run through that right now, but it probably would be worth your time if you get the time to look through that. All right. So as it says in the get the dot get JSON method, the first parameter is the URL for the JSON file with JSON as the extension. 
The second parameter is the function that processes that data if the request is successful. All right. Within the success function, they mentioned there the first dot each processes each collection of items returned. In this case, it contains a single collection with all the team members in it. So we're doing the same kind of thing we did before, but rather than returning XML data, as we saw previously, we are now returning JSON data. All right, so again, it's a dot get JSON. All right, the code other than that is similar in nature. I'm not saying it's a, it's a identical. But as mentioned, to process the return JSON data, you use nested dot, you know, dollar sign each methods. The function in the first method will process each collection of the return data. So it's one collection of all the team members. The, the second each method will process each one individually. Like I said, it's very similar to having a loop within a loop. All right. How to send data then with an AJAX request. That's the next thing that's discussed in here. As it says, it shows how to send data with the request. To do that, you use the data parameter of a shortcut method to supply either a string or a map that contains the data. In the first example, it uses a string to send one name value pair and asks for a name that has a value of Wilbur. The second one uses a map to send the same name value pair. So let's take a look you'll see that they are similar in nature. All right. And in one, in one case, here it's using dot get, okay, that, but it's using a map in here. Where is it using the map? I guess it'll be inside of here where you're processing the data. What they're showing is virtually identical to one another. All right. Now, it says here these helper methods for working with AJAX. And they talk about serializing and deserializing. All right, or serializing and serializing an array. Okay, so I'm going to type in here difference between ser serialize and deserialize. <clears throat> Serialization is, a, is a, a, an attempt to convert an object data stream into a stream of bytes. Deserialization is, a, is to convert a stream of bytes back into the original. And I gave two examples of this in class, so I'm going to say them again. The first one is totally non-computer, all right? And that is back in the 90s, I think it was. There was a TV show on that's still on tonight or today on Nickelodeon or one of those channels, Nick at Night, I don't know, uh, Home Improvement with Tim Allen. And Tim was a hardware guy. He had his own hardware TV show. All right. The, the point of that is, though, that at the end of the series, in the last episode, Tim's wife, uh, Jill, I think it is, had gone back to school to get her psychology degree. And she was offered a job. They lived in Michigan. She was offered a job at a clinic or someplace in Indiana. Well, Tim put everything aside, quit his job so they could move to Indiana. Their kids were, were grown and by and large had moved out of the house, okay? But the point is this. Um, they were reminiscing over their house, and they were, they were talking about, uh, Jill said, boy, wouldn't it be nice if we could just put this house on wheels and just take it with us to Indiana? And Tim would always would, would say stuff and answer with, hmm, like that. That's, he had one of those hmm moments. And in the next thing, you saw them, hypothetically, uh, putting the truck or the, the house on a flatbed and they were going to take it with them to Indiana. The point is that isn't very logical, but when you think about it, what if they decided instead, let's assume the house was made out of bricks, okay? And let's assume they could take each brick apart, brick by brick, and then they could put the bricks back together again. Well, taking the house apart brick by brick is kind of serializing, and putting the house back together again is deserializing. And if you still are confused, it's kind of the way data travels over the Internet. All right. When it travels over a wire, there's only so much data that can go through at a time. So the data is broken down into what are typically referred to as packets. And packets are sent from one end to the other. But when it goes from the, the receiving end, or the, the, I'm sorry, the sending end to the receiving end, on the receiving end, those packets must be reassembled together. So breaking them up 
is the serialization and, and, and putting them back together is the deserialization. Hopefully that helped, didn't hurt as far as an explanation goes. All right, so the serialized helper method with Ajax, as it says, it encodes a set of form elements as a string that can be used as a data parameter. And serializing an array encodes a set of form elements as an array of name value pairs. So as they mention here, <clears throat> when you send data with an Ajax request, the URL is for a server side, so you're sending it out to a server someplace. All right. The script is responsible for returning the data in either XML or JSON format. The data parameter in a jQuery shortcut method, as they say, is a name value pair. A name val value pair, excuse me, again, is kind of like if I told you to look up the word responsible. Let's just assume you were a young kid and you didn't know what that meant. You'd go to the dictionary, you'd go look under the R's, the RE's, etc., and you'd find responsible. So here the name would be responsible and the definition would be the value. All right, so these helper functions, as it says for Ajax, make it easy to package form data before sending it all back off to the server. All right. Next, how to use the dot Ajax method for working with Ajax. The dot Ajax method, as it says, provides more object, more options rather, for making Ajax requests. So what do we have here? Some of the options that can be used. Well, when you think about it, if you're going to be asking for something from a server, you want to give it a URL. All right. Before send, what it, as it says, what you can do right there is it's a function that's executed before the request is sent. Why would you want to use that? Well, maybe to make sure that um, what you were asking for makes sense. So if you were you know, asking for something from a server someplace, it would have to probably start with HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, etc. Cache is a Boolean value that determines what, if the browser can cache the response. The browser quite often, so let, let's assume for a second I go out to CNN.com. All right, so I go out to CNN.com and it loads everything on, and it shows, it shows me the picture, and I'm on there for 10 minutes, okay? And I get off. And now 10 minutes later, I come back on again. Probably what's happened is I've got a copy of everything that was on that web page. Okay. And what the system will do is it'll look and see whether or not it's changed in the last 10 minutes. If it, if, if it hasn't, it'll give me my cached version because it can bring it up faster. All right. Okay. Complete a function that's executed when the request finishes. Okay. What do you want to do once everything finished? Data. A mapper string sent to the server with the request. Error for just that, to be able to handle the error. JSON P, which I didn't talk about before, but it's a string containing the name of the JSON with padding. That's parameter that can be passed to the server. Password, what you want to do if it succeeds. How long you want to wait before it times out. This can be very important because you, you want the thing to, to, to be able to sit there and, and go indefinitely. A lot of times things will time out after 30 seconds or 90 seconds or whatever. The type, again, get or post, and the username. So as mentioned here, the .ajax method provides options that give you more control over how Ajax works. The jqxhr object is jQuery's superset of the xhr object. JSONP, as I mentioned, stands for JSON with padding. It lets you request data from a server in a different domain. Typically, in the past, that was prohibited. You would only be able to, to request information from the domain you were currently on, and that was done for security reasons. All right. All right. Not only can you use the .ajax method for working with data, but you can use it, for example, for loading data. And as they mentioned here, when successful, the application in Figure 1211 is like the one we talk, looked at earlier. However, it sets the timeout option for 10,000 milliseconds, so it times out after 10 seconds. In addition, as mentioned, it provides two functions besides the function for successful completion. So let's take a look at it. So you'll notice right here it's going out, and if it can't get the information within 10, 10 seconds, you get this. All right, so it provides the timeout function, and as they mentioned, it also provides two functions besides the one for just successful completion. So the rest of the chapter here 
talks about how to use Ajax with Flickr. So it's the last 10 or so pages. All right, so let's go and go out because I don't use Flickr. So here's Flickr.com. All right. Home to tens of billions of photos and photo groups. So you start for free. I don't want to sign up, so I'm not going to. So I guess I'm not going to do anything with this. But you saw, at least on the home page there, what it's supposed to be. All right, so let's see. Let's say, for example, uh, I don't know if it'll let me even look for photos. How about Christmas? All right, it probably isn't going to let me do anything. Search photos. These don't look like Christmas photos. So, I don't know. I've never used it. But that's what they talk about for the rest of the chapter. So let's take a look at the code or, or the stuff in the chapter here for this. So it says, once you know how to use Ajax and you have the skills that you need for getting data from popular websites like YouTube, tw Twitter, and Flickr, you can get data from any website that provides an API for that. All right. One of the things we'll probably end up doing, and I, I even shouldn't say probably, we may end up doing, is um, in fall is if we go out, for example, to github.com and we go out to, I think it's public-apis slash public-apis. If we go out there, now this is animals, and I didn't want animals, but that's fine. Let's just go back one. These are public APIs, and there's a really good program that's out there. And what happens with this public APIs is the guy does go into animals and goes into dogs. And when you look here, if I go and click this, what is it doing? You notice I'm getting a picture, and if I click again, I'm getting a different picture. So what is it doing? It's telling us to go out to dog.ceo, to go out to their API, go out to their breeds page, find a random image, and display it right here. That's it. And the JSON that gets done for doing that, the message is the picture, and the status, if it works, is success. So there's a really nice program out there that I'm going to show you in a second, but it uses this breeds list that's right here. You go, what breeds list? Well, look at, notice here if I come in here and I change this, and I put in, for example, English Bulldog. See how the picture changes? And now I'm just getting random pictures of English Bulldogs. All right, if I change this to... Oh, they, they, they have changed this a little bit. This is the kind of dog that we have, a Bashan Frise, and I start clicking, I get random pictures of a Bashan. All right, you get the idea. But what, what this program does, I'm going to show it to you, because I'm going to, another a guy that I follow quite a bit, his name is Brad Schiff. Uh, where is it? YouTube. I'm going to just type it in, in here. So Brad Schiff. Dog API. Well, it didn't give me what I thought it was. Was that YouTube? There we go. There we go. That's him. And he literally creates an application in here. We all know that feeling, answering, because that you start going through it, this is it. Eight breed Very list function. It says, you can see that it says infinite dog breed, like this, and you click on, you click With on that data. anything that you want to click we don't on in the list, and it'll give you a picture, and it'll just back keep to changing it. It's choose a dog breed. Words, we don't actually really acknowledge dog. that. Because, because obviously, I, right, and I don't know, I was going to show it to you, but... The there you go. Okay, at this point, now that we have the basic layout set up, let's get back to JavaScript and let's have it use... He does a really good job. This is about an hour and 10 minutes long, but it's a very, it's an, actually, it's an interesting presentation. It's very simplistic. There's not a lot to it, but he does a good job of explaining the fundamentals and what goes on. 
So his, his is uh, Learn Web Code. I, you can see I'm a subscriber. All right. So the, the rest of the chapter shows you how to use Ajax with the API for Flickr. As it says, the goal here is not so much to show you how to use Flickr, but rather how to use the API. Flickr is a website that allows you to store photos on it for free. The first table that's in here lists the feeds that Flickr provides, as you can see. Here is the base URL for retrieving a public photo stream. Typically, it'll start out with API dot, then the name of the company. All right, here's some query parameters. So, for instance, with the user ID, if I knew, let's say, that my brother had an account on here, I could put in his user ID and probably find out, you know, the pictures that he has posted out there, that kind of a thing. So as mentioned, Flickr is a website that lets you store your photos on it for free, so you can access them from wherever, and so can other people. It provides a number of feeds that you can retrieve photos and related information. In this chapter, you learn how to retrieve photos from the public photos and video feed. To do that, you use a URL with one or more query parameters, such as the ones that are shown here. All right, so this would be, again, this is an ID. If we look down here, we got waterfall and Yosemite type of pictures. So this, <clears throat> how to display Flickr data on a page. The table that you see here, as they mentioned on the previous page, summarizes the Flickr data items returned from the photo feed. The items data item represents the collection of returned items. You use this as the first parameter in a dollar sign dot each method to process each item and work your way through. All right. Here is the associated code. So as the author mentions, you can use the dot get JSON that we learned about earlier to get data from a Flickr feed. Why? Because that's typically how data is returned. You use the dot each method to work your way through here. All right. And that's what they're doing, for lack of better words. All right. How to review the feed from a website. It looks pretty ugly when you first take a look at it. There it is. So what they're saying on the previous page is it may be helpful to see the JSON data that's returned from a website. We can use that to identify the data items that you can use in the application in case they're not included in the API documentation. It can also help you review the data, the value of the data items on the page to make sure that the correct data is, be, is displayed. So in other words, you ask for what you received is what you asked for. <clears throat> So to review a feed, as it says, you can type in or paste the URL, then press the Enter key to see the contents of the JSON feed in the browser window. There's also tools that you can use, just so you know, that, you can, that, that, that can take JSON that can appear in a very raw or ugly format and pretty it up, and we'll talk about those in fall. So as it says, the JSON feed identifies the data items to, you can use in the application. It's particularly important when you use Flickr because they're not identified in the documentation. You may also want to use this technique when the API documentation is difficult to understand. All right, so how to display descriptions from the Flitter, Flickr photo feed, rather. <clears throat> this example here, notice what's changed. So we already had this information, but now, for example, maybe out on Flickr, we've got our pictures for everybody who works for this company. So what we're shown here is how to display the descriptions for the photos in a Flickr feed. So we see a description of the first photo in the feed. It starts with a thumbnail followed by the text that describes the photo. In the jQuery fo uh, code that, that's, going, that's going to be shown down below, you can see the parameters that are used for the URL. They retrieve the photos posted by a specific user that has a specific tag in them. All right. As they mentioned, this application uses the description data item to display the photo as well as the test, the text rather, because it's formatted with HTML tags. It's not necessary to do that with a jQuery code. All right. How to search for photos by tags is we're just about finished with this. It says so far you've seen examples that retrieve photos from Flickr 
that were posted by a specific user that had a specific tag or that did both. On the next page, it shows you how you can retrieve photos that have been posted by anyone. All right. So if I, you know, they're using yachts and racing in here, but if if I knew that, you know, someone in my family or a friend, I could put in that information, but I could also set it up like this that I could see every yacht or racing picture that's in there. All right. And that's pretty much it. So again, we did go through an example on our own that I've already shown you, this number fun thing. And that's in a separate lecture. Okay? That's going to be it.